This tutorial is all about the structure of alcohols and looking at ethanol, specifically the ways that ethanol can be made industrially and its uses. First we're going to concentrate on the formulas and here we will return to some of the work that we learnt in Module C1 about molecular and displayed formulas and general formulas as well. Ethanol belongs to a family of alcohols, methanol, ethanol, propanol, butanol and pentanol. As you can see, as we go from alcohol to alcohol, the number of carbons increases by one. At the same time, the number of hydrogens increases by two. They have a general formula, so you could actually predict the formula of any um, alcohol if you knew the number of carbons. You could guess that the number of hydrogens would be the same, but doubled plus one. So in other words, the general formula of these alcohols would be CN, H, 2N plus 1, O, H. Next we're going to look at the manufacture of alcohol and first the manufacture by fermentation. That's using yeast. At foundation level you have to recall the conditions for fermentation but at higher level you need to be able to explain them. To make ethanol by fermentation we need an aqueous solution of glucose, we need enzymes within yeast, we need a temperature of around about 37 degrees, anything very much lower than that the enzymes become inactive and anything very much above that the enzyme becomes denatured and stops working. And we need anaerobic conditions, which means no oxygen or air to get to it, because this can cause the oxidation of the ethanol to ethanoic acid, and the um, ethanol will turn into essentially vinegar. Another thing that we need to do, which we'll look at in a moment, is to then distill the mixture that we get. Distillation is necessary because the fermentation process only makes about a 12 to 15 percent solution of ethanol. In order to make 100 percent ethanol, we then have to separate the ethanol from that aqueous solution. Distillation, or fractional distillation in this case, works because we have a mixture of ethanol which boils at 78 degrees and water which boils at 100 degrees. Therefore, when we heat up the mixture, the ethanol boils at the lower temperature first and it distills off and separates therefore from the water. This is the overall word and symbol equation both of which you will have to learn. Here's a past paper question. Ethanol is made by the fermentation of glucose. Carbon dioxide is also made in the process. Complete the word equation for fermentation. Well this is straightforward. It's given you the information that you need. The two products are ethanol and carbon dioxide. Fermentation makes a dilute solution of ethanol. What method of separation could be used to get almost pure ethanol? This method would be fractional distillation. A fermentation reaction takes place at 40 degrees Celsius. When the temperature is raised to 80 degrees Celsius, fermentation stops. Explain why. We'll say here that the enzymes in yeast are, and here's the key word, denatured at 80 degrees. Look at the displayed formula for methanol, CH3OH. Draw the displayed formula of ethanol, C2H5OH. So it's going to have a similar kind of structure. It's going to have CH3 and then another CH2 and then an O and an H. And as in the example, every atom and every bond has to be shown. Look at this table, it shows the formulae of some alcohols. Now you have to learn the formulae of five alcohols, that's methanol, ethanol, propanol, butanol and pentanol. 
So the one for propanol, which is in the right order in the table, would be C3H7OH, because it will have one more carbon and two more hydrogens. And then the general formula for an alkene is CNH2N. Write down the general formula for an alcohol. Even if you haven't learned it, you can work it out from above. The number of carbons would be N. The number of hydrogens next will be 2N plus 1 and then an OH on the end. Here are the answers. Uh, the enzyme being denatured, also losing shape, which is what happens to it. Funnily enough, they say yeast dies, but obviously not the enzyme dies, because the enzyme is never living. It's just a, a molecule. The correct diagram here should have the OH, although uh, they do allow you to write just OH rather than O and then an H separately, which I'm surprised at because that's not strictly true for a displayed formula. It should show every single bond and various ways in which you can write the general formula for the alcohols. Sarah and Daniel investigate fermentation. Look at the diagram. It shows the apparatus that they use. Ethanol is made by fermentation, yeast and solution A are used to make ethanol. Write down the name of solution A, well that would be uh, sugar solution, probably also allow glucose solution or another form of sugar. Uh, a gas is made during fermentation, write down the name of that gas, that would be carbon dioxide. Fermentation works best under these specific conditions, a temperature between 25 and 50 degrees and in the absence of oxygen. Explain why these conditions lead to successful fermentation. Uh, temperature below 20, or between 25 and 50. Um, above this, the enzyme denatures. Below this, The enzyme is inactive. So there we've said why the 25 to 50 is the best range of temperatures. The absence of oxygen, uh, oxygen can make the ethanol oxidize to ethanoic acid. And look at the displayed formula of ethanol, write down the molecular formula of ethanol. Well, here we'd write down the number of each uh, type of atom, so there would be two carbons. The hydrogens, there's actually six, so we could write H6O, or normally we write, it was write C2H5 and then OH afterwards. And here are the answers. In the first question, it was particularly looking for glucose as being the uh, mysterious solution, but they were allowing, as I wrote, sugar solution. The gas, definitely carbon dioxide. Uh, in the next question about the optimum temperature, to say that the optimum temperature um, range, just to say that is insufficient, you had to be specific and say that either the yeast is inactive at temperatures below that, or denatured at temperatures above that. I wrote both, but uh, you only had to write one or the other. And the idea of the absence of oxygen, either you say about it being anaerobic respiration, or as I did, it um, oxygen will cause the formation of ethanoic acid, or uh, oxidizes the alcohol. And again, two possible ways of writing that molecular formula. Now there's a second way that ethanol can be made industrially, and that's by what's called direct hydration of ethene using a phosphoric acid catalyst. Here, a mixture of ethene and steam are passed over a heated catalyst of phosphoric 5 acid. And here we get then the chemical reaction that you'd expect in that the ethene and the water makes ethanol or C2H4 and H2O makes C2H5OH. It's called the hydration of ethene. 
Now that we know that there are two methods for making ethanol industrially, we're expected to be able to evaluate one against the other, saying what are the advantages and disadvantages of each uh, in terms of sustainability and so on, and then also about ethanol being used as a fuel and why one method uh, can be termed a renewable fuel and the other method a non-renewable fuel. So let's compare the two methods. Fermentation is a somewhat slower process than ethene because it's a batch process. That means that you have to fill a tank with a sugar solution and with your yeast so that the enzymes can take a few days to uh, digest the sugar and make alcohol. Of course, this fermentation method only makes a weak solution of ethanol, which then has to be further concentrated by fractional distillation but it does make alcohol which is fit for consumption. Even though the other method, the hydration of ethene, makes nearly 100% ethanol, it does contain impurities which are toxic, so it's not suitable for human consumption. Finally, ethanol can be used as a fuel, for example, for running cars and other transport. When it's done by fermentation, this can, can be considered to be a green fuel. It's a renewable feedstock, the sugar, and therefore it can be considered to be a renewable fuel. Whereas ethanol, made by the other method, uses ethene which has been derived from crude oil. So that's using a non-renewable feedstock. The Treadbarton Bus Company in Nottingham has been trialling the use of ethanol for its buses, which produces, as it says on the bus, much less carbon dioxide than would a diesel fueled bus, and it also uses uh, environmentally friendly ethanol, which has been derived from fermentation of sugar, which means that there should be no net addition of carbon into the atmosphere, and therefore it's a very green fuel. Finally, the atom economy of a process gives you an idea of how sustainable the process can be. Remember from a previous module that the atom economy is the mass of a useful product divided by the mass of all the reactants used to make it, expressed as a percentage. So, in the first process of fermentation, the mass of our useful product, ethanol, we're getting two molecules of ethanol here. Each one has an MR of 46. Therefore, that would give us 92 grams of ethanol. Over the mass of all the reactants used to make it, which is one molecule of glucose, which would be 180 grams, expressed as a percentage. And that makes 51% which essentially means that only 51% of the mass of the original sugar actually goes into making the ethanol. In the second case, in the direct hydration method, the mass of the ethanol made is one molecule of ethanol, which is 46 grams, divided by the mass of the reactants, which is a molecule of ethene, 28, added to a molecule of water, which is 18, which adds up to 46 grams and multiply that by 100% and here we get 100%. So although we're not getting a green version of ethanol, at least there's very little wastage in that 100% of the reactants go up to make the product. Having a high atom economy does lead to you thinking that you have a fairly sustainable process. But another thing that you also need to consider is the percentage yield. Percentage yield, as we learned in an earlier module, is the actual yield you get divided by the predicted yield expressed as a percentage. Now, in each of these processes, there will be a difference in yield. And you may be asked to consider, given some information about percentage yield, which is the more sustainable of the two processes.